You! Me? You think this is funny? In a cosmic sort of way, yes. Well, Mr. Funny Man, is this how you get your sick kicks? What? It's just an ordinary- OH MY GOODNESS! I tried, Mr. Churchill. I really did. Oh, what now? On June 6, 1944, the Allied coalition consisting of mainly troops from the United States, Great Britain, and Canada, along with soldiers from several other countries, assaulted the beaches of Normandy in the biggest amphibious invasion to ever take place in history, codenamed Operation Overlord. This attack took years of planning and preparation and is regarded as one of the most successful military operations in history, especially considering the risks involved. This video, though, is not about this. This is about Operation Overlord's idiot stepbrother, the Dardanelle Campaign or more commonly known as Gallipoli. By the end of 1914, the situation on the Western Front had stagnated and bogged down into attritional trench warfare. Britain, upon being confronted with this reality, found itself out of its element, as it was a naval power stuck in a ground war. It had already used its navy to blockade Germany and fight successful battles against their navy. This, however, was not able to sway anything on the Western Front. In January 1915, First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill, yep, that one, proposed a plan to get the navy back into the fight. With the Ottomans siding with the Germans and actively fighting against Britain's ally Russia, who had been requesting material assistance from the British, he formulated a plan to open up a route to the Black Sea. The objective was twofold. First, to provide said assistance, and second, to hopefully eliminate the Ottomans from the war, and in doing so, convince neutral nations such as possibly Greece to enter the war on the British side. On January 13, 1915, Churchill's plan was approved by the British War Council. At this point, though, the plan only called for naval operations and was only given a little over a month to be implemented. On February 19th, the first attacks on the Dardanelles by two Royal Navy ships and one French ship took place. The naval assaults continued for about two months but ran into multiple problems. The Ottoman defenses consisted of long-range artillery on the shore and naval mines in the sea. To combat this, the British had to employ battleships to attack the land and civilian minesweeping ships to clear the sea. The problem with this was that neither could make the first blow to begin the attack. If the battleships went first, they could silence the shore guns, but would strike mines and be damaged. If the minesweepers went first, they could clear the mines, but would take heavy fire from the artillery on the shore. In fact, in 9 out of the 11 attempts the minesweepers made to go out and do their job, they had to retreat before fully being able to begin sweeping for mines. By April, it was clear the strategy was not working, and the British opted to begin landing troops on the shore. These included the British 29th Division, landing at Cape Helles, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, better known as ANZAC, landing at what would later become known as ANZAC Cove, and some French forces made up of Senegalese troops, landing at Coombe Kale on the Asian shore as a diversion. And this is the part of the Gallipoli battle that is present in common memory. And to put it briefly, it was a complete train wreck. This landing was not in any way the picture of amphibious landings we have in our heads from subsequent wars. Instead of specialized landing craft, soldiers were moving onto the beach just simply using rowboats, which made them easy targets for Ottoman soldiers. Anzac Beach was especially problematic as the Ottomans held the high ground on the bluffs overlooking the landing zones. The Navy attempted to remedy this problem, but to no effect due to the shallow trajectory of their guns. It's over! Anzacs. I have the high ground! You underestimate my- Navy. Don't try it! You fucking bad cunt! Many of the landings on Cape Helles were unopposed, though, until British troops began to move inland and the Ottomans counterattacked. Although no objectives were taken and the casualties were high, the landing was technically successful as Commonwealth forces established a toehold on their positions, and this was enough to give the British commanders optimism for the future of the operation. These hopes, though, were soon dashed as the battle deteriorated into the same trench warfare as the Western Front. Due to the ferocity of the Ottomans and their insistence on counterattacks, for which they paid dearly, Commonwealth forces were never able to move any further inland and were stuck in the same positions for about eight months. I could recount to you the actions within this period, but it's just a lot of unsuccessful attacks from both sides. And over the course of the battle, the Anzacs were only able to advance once, but were quickly repelled. Due to the very rocky terrain present, conditions deteriorated very quickly. Both sides realized early on that they were unable to bury their dead, which began to rot out in the hot temperatures over the summer. This in turn attracted flies infecting the drinking water, which led to outbreaks of disease. Many truces were called throughout the course of the battle to clear the dead to attempt to combat this problem. Both the British and Ottomans were low on supplies and ammunition at times, but the Ottomans were better off than most people think, having plenty of weapons and ammunition and also making use of captured ones. In many places on the line, the opposing trenches were very close to each other, and fraternization was common at times. Commonwealth forces also had problems with combat fatigue due to their front lines being so close to the coast. Because of this, all the ground they held was within the range of Ottoman artillery. 
so they were unable to rotate troops on and off the front as they were still in danger while they were anywhere on shore. And actually, when the Commonwealth forces do retreat between the 18th and 20th of December of 1915, they have to do so in a segmented fashion to prevent them from being shelled by the Ottomans as they attempt to leave. And this retreat is the only real example of intelligent strategic thinking in this campaign. A campaign that was supposed to be a big, out-of-the-box move. But it's World War I, so trench warfare. By the end of it, 44,000 Allied and 85,000 Ottoman soldiers were dead. And Churchill was demoted, never to be heard from again. Top 10 Celebrity Career Comebacks but this does go down as the worst defeat in British military history, and the second worst in Australian military history. The memory of this battle is often one of a missed opportunity. That if the Royal Navy was more effective, or if the infantry was better supported, the goals of the operation could have been achieved, and that the stalemate would have been broken. But I think these are retcon sentiments to help justify the terrible plan. Because if you're being honest with yourself, this plan was awful. It was planned with the assumption that just the sheer presence of the British military would be enough to cause the Turks to capitulate. And I think this is maybe in the smallest way justifiable, given the status of the Ottoman Empire in the years leading up, having been dubbed the sick man of Europe. But to say that some minor British military action will cause them to fold is just sheer hubris. I mean, just listen to this. The reason the British thought that fighting the Ottoman Empire was a good idea is the belief that the Ottoman Empire was a completely rotten state with an hopeless army that only had to be kicked. It was like kicking in a door, a rotting door of a collapsing building. Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? The Ottomans had been doing well fighting the Russians in the Caucasus and now had the advantage of fighting on and for their home territory. There is absolutely no evidence that a few British destroyers were going to change their mind about their status in the war. Second, this operation was not given close to enough attention in time to be planned. As I said earlier, within the span of a month, this operation goes from the drawing board to being put in action, and that is when it was only supposed to be a naval operation. The amphibious assault is tacked on later only when the initial plan fails, and also seems very underdeveloped given its rough start and equally poor results. Also, given the months of naval bombardment, it's rather obvious to the Ottomans where the British landings would take place. Compare this to Operation Overlord 1944. Years of planning and deception go into pulling off this invasion successfully. And this is probably due, somewhat at least, to the lessons learned from the poor planning at Gallipoli. It is hard to not see the cruel irony in this scenario, given how it was supposed to break the cycle of trench warfare and ended up becoming some of the worst of it due to what I would call near criminal mistakes made by commanders. And unfortunately, there aren't really too many impacts from this campaign. The biggest would probably be the entry of Italy to the war on the side of the Allies during the first few weeks of the campaign as it looked more promising, resulting in an additional front for the Austro-Hungarians to their west. The campaign did, though, greatly shape the national identities of many of the countries of the soldiers involved. Former Ottoman officers from this battle, such as Mustafa Kemal, went on to found and shape the Republic of Turkey after the Ottoman Empire collapsed, and Anzac soldiers who had fought under their own flag for the first time in history became a thing of pride for Australians and New Zealanders alike. But Gallipoli as a whole was, and should be remembered as, another pointless bloody slugfest in a war that had two years and many more battles still to come. Uh, don't we pity the poor civilians sitting around the fire? Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Oh, it's a lovely oh, war. Oh, it's a lovely war. Oh, it's a shame to take the pain. As soon as rebellion has gone, we feel just as heavy as lead. But we never get up to the top and bring the bricks up to bed. 